you could just give us a status check on where Johnson & Johnson is in its COVID-19 vaccine development timeline uh, and sort of where you see the company standing versus other efforts. We heard from AstraZeneca today. They plan to start a phase three trial as soon as next month. Are you still planning on phase one in September? Yes, it's still the still the planning to start phase one in September, and we cl closely work with FDA and EMA on all regulatory steps towards that. It's a very careful design process to uh, go through. We started with 12 different vaccine constructs. We selected the best one. Uh, we now tested in human. Uh, you are now starting testing in animal models. We validated those animal models. They have been published on Monday in Science. Two papers were published showing that the animal model uh, is valid and that vaccines, DNA prototypes can protect animals. And now we are challenging with our vaccine, which is a which is a proven vector-based delivery where we which boosts the activity of the DNA very much. We can therefore now test it uh, in the month of June. And then we do GMP upscaling, and if all is that ready, we will enter phase one in September. In parallel, we are upscaling the manufacturing and hope to make a billion vaccine next year. That is the part of the timeline in joint discussion with EMA and FDA. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting to kind of put J&J's timelines into the context of the rest of the field, because perhaps your starting date in humans is later, but you're still talking about similar timelines in terms of actually having the vaccine potentially available to people early 2021 if all goes well. Could you just explain that difference? Is J&J taking more time to the lead up to human trials, uh, being more careful? How can you explain just why the timelines are so different for you? Yeah, we have definitely taken more time to make a selection of the vaccine. And that's also shown in the animal models that different type, different pieces of the spike DNA and different modalities to that give different protection in the animal models. And that was a very careful selection to go to the maximum protective spike piece we could use. And we have done that very carefully in the first three months of the uh, of the work. Um, then in parallel, we we have done the upscaling work so that the decision, as I said before, is based on the best immuno immunogenic vaccine combined with the best productivity in the vaccine. And to get to a billion vaccines, you need a huge productivity in your cell line. And to get to the entire world with, ma with vaccines and very fast, you need to be careful work on doing that. The other point is, is we have done a lot of work before. We had four vaccines. We have done it four times in HIV, in RSV, in, in uh, Zika, and in Ebola. And that learned us a lot on being very careful on selecting which, which vaccine you make, how you upscale it, and how do you bring it to the clinic. And so that experience tells us step by step what we need to do. And we have that blueprint now applied in an accelerated way, which brings a vaccine by the end of this year, hopefully, um, and at a billion uh, level next year. Mm -mm. And I want to ask you also about the the construct of the vaccine. Uh, you use a, a, a virus to deliver it, an adenovirus, uh, as sort of the vector. Uh, and there was a paper in Science uh, just a week ago where Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins of the NIH uh, mentioned that one of the potential things to look at with vaccines that use this adenovirus vector is that if people have been pre-exposed to that virus, they may have immunity to it, and that could affect how effective the vaccine is, and that'll be need to, needed to look at in early studies. I mean, you have a lot of data on this approach in other viruses. Yeah. What is your take on that? Yeah, we have studied that, of course, extensively. Otherwise, we would have used the same vector every time again. And um, with Ebola now, with HIV, with Zika, and also with RSV, we learned that that's in with the adeno-26 vector we have. It's not a fact. It's it's in some regions there is somewhat more. Um, pre-existing um, uh, antibodies against it, but in most of the regions, not. And that's very different with uh, adenovectors like the AD5, which was used in, in, in uh, five to 10 years ago, where you found a lot of anti antibodies in humans. And that we carefully selected this, uh, this uh, adenovector. And uh, so far, we have not seen that, even after many exposures in the, same, in the same person, we have not seen building up immunogenicity against the vector itself. Uh, the science behind that is complex, too complex to explain here, but we have very good evidence that that's not the case for our vaccine. Mm -hmm.
Brennan, it's great to have you on. In a week where um, I think investors and the general public are really trying to get their arms around the nuances associated with uh, data and different studies that have been coming out, I, I want to go back to the monkeys for a minute. How much weight um, should be put on the data as it relates to some of the results, some of the research, whether it's yours, whether it's some of the other reports we've gotten this week, uh, about positive results in rhesus monkeys, how much of that can translate over to human beings? Well, it's difficult to predict for this disease because it never happened. But what we have been able to show in one of the two studies which have been published is that you can, you can make an, a non-human primate sick uh, and then the virus multiplies, they get antibodies, they cure from it. And then when you re-challenge that animal, you are, it's not possible to re-challenge the animal. They very quickly mount immunity against COVID. So it is an animal model which can be used for challenge. The second one was where we, uh, where Dan Baruch and his team in Boston and we together with our folks, we tested several prototype DNA um, vaccines, which then uh, showed protection and the level of antibodies was correlated with the level of protection. So there is a correlation which you can study in animal models. How predictive that is for humans will, will be shown later, but it's a good model for us to at least start testing whether we, which, which factor, which DNA, and what should we use and select as the best possible immunogenic vaccine to protect people from COVID.